it's the middle of June, 14th of June 2020. The lawn, what was a lawn, the lawn that I spent several years getting in good condition, the lawn that I bought an expensive lawnmower for a few years ago to make stripes, alternate stripes like a proper lawn, it's gone. The opportunity of lockdown made me think I should let it grow up and see what happens. It's produced a few nice oxide daisies. This, this area had a noxious weed called field wood rush, which is a very difficult weed in lawns. And it's a coarse, a coarse rush spreading across. So I thought, well, I will poison it with glyphosate weed killer. It's a marvellous machine. So I've done the initial cutting through the turf. What I need to do now is to rake up, rake up all the debris from the top. My aim here is to make a, a wildflower patch with this area um, and it will be it will be suitable for that because it's probably quite low in fertility it's a very heavy soil it's not much nutrient in it uh, and you want a, a, a nutrient light soil for wildflowers so that the grass doesn't overwhelm the the wildflowers uh, but because of this problem with this the the, uh, the, the field wood rush I was telling you about I'm going to lime the soil uh, to um, increase the pH, uh, which helps to stop this plant getting a, a hold on things. It's the um, it's the 19th of July. This is now weeks later. I just didn't finish this project. I just left it. I ran out of energy. There was still some grass to clear up, which I've just done. And it wasn't a big job. It took me 20 minutes, to, uh, two or three barrel loads. So I'm not quite sure why I left it for so long. Uh, but um, I need to plough it again. And I was leaving it until we had a decent rain to soften the ground up. And we had a, a pretty good rain last night. So I'm going to get out the cultivator again and go over it for a second and third time and see how we get on. It's a good machine. It's quite a heavy machine. Uh, it's got five settings on this mechanical gear stick here. Uh, neutral to start it and to push it along. Uh, a forward movement when the blades don't go around. A backward movement when the blades don't go around so you can manoeuvre it. And then two forward movements. One where the, the tines go forward with the motion of the machine. And one where the tines go backwards while the machine goes forwards. And the backwards one really obviously digs in. So I didn't use it here, I was just using the forwards one because it's still quite hard even though we had a rain. And also because I want to bring some of the turf to the surface. I'm, gonna, I'm going to have another go at raking this up. But even just going forward you could hear that the machine was doing a lot of work. It feels like it's going to stall. Uh, but it doesn't stall except when it gets a stone caught in the tines or some roots attached to it or something like that. This is pretty stony, stone free ground. So it's very low geared and therefore very powerful at going, at moving the tines at a very slow speed. So even if they're, even if they're digging into the ground it still keeps going. Uh, and it's got a big weight on the front to hold it down. And uh, I have to push down on it to a degree to keep it in the ground, but obviously you can't push it too much because then it really would stall. And the tines, look, and there's two sets, and you have to keep them a bit clean. 
they need to be, they need to have a bit of movement, a bit of play. So let's have another break up. a lot better than it was when I did it the first time several weeks ago partly because it's been done once partly because it's wet um, and I've used a springtime rake to rake up the the, the grass the, the clods of grass uh, because I want to get the clods out but I don't want, I don't want to take too much soil with them uh, to minimise the amount I have to move. Also, I don't want all that soil on the compost heap. So that grass will be good for the compost heap because it contains lots of nutrients. And I want to get it off this piece of land to reduce the level of nutrients uh, because that's what a wildflower meadow needs. Otherwise, the grass tends to take over. Uh, so I want to get out as much of the nutrients as I can and that involves taking off as much of the bits of grass as I can. So I'm going to clear this up now, which is not a pleasant job, because it's difficult to pick up. So this kind of rake I think was the right tool for this job, rather than a garden rake or a, a landscaping rake, because I could spring out the turf and leave the soil behind. Now for picking it up, I'm using a flat tine fork. It's a bit bent, so that makes it a bit more difficult, so it's not good really but it's got flat tines and that makes it much easier to get underneath the piles and, and get them onto the barrow. Last time I tried using a, a round tine fork and that didn't work too well and I tried using a, a shovel and that got too much soil that didn't work well. Uh, so this isn't easy but it's the best tool for the job. I'm putting on a heap just to, to the side here. I don't want it directly on the compost heap because there's so much of it. But I might have to put some. This is really, this is really not the best time of year to be doing this job because it's hot. I'm kind of wish, wishing I never started it at this time of year. I'm trying to minimise the amount of work I'm putting into the job. So I've got the turf. Um, in rows uh, and I'm going along the rows so I've got room for the barrow in between so I can load from both sides and uh, the flat tine fork is the best tool uh, and I'm getting it underneath the turf so making sure it's loose to pick up and picking it up and with one action taking it to so it's the tines on the barrow and then sometimes I'm shaking it to get it off, sometimes I'm turning it over and sometimes I'm scraping, if necessary, scraping the tines on the side of the barra in order to get off the turf that's stuck. So I'm doing everything I can to make it as easy as possible for me but I'm still dismayed at the amount of work it is. One must not only think about efficiency of movement, although that's important, but one also must think about how one is using the tools and what, how one is in one's body. That's particularly hard for, for most of us, I think. It's very hard for me. Um, I'm constantly distracted by the, uh, the work of the task and I used to be more overly focused on completing the task which is not a good thing to be. Uh, one has to be in the task, and that's what I try to do these days. Now I have a bit more time. Now I'm retired. It's a luxury not to have to worry about completing the job by two o'clock when you've got a meeting or something like that. I don't have any meetings. It's wonderful. So I can focus on the doing the job, which I do, 
But what I don't do enough of is focusing on how I'm using my body. <clears throat> and uh, one thing that reduces your efficiency, but it's a good thing to do, I think, and I haven't done it yet. I did it with the rake, but I haven't done it with a fork, is to, I'm left-handed, is to swap hands. So I'm going to try the next barrow to do a bit with that hand. And uh, I always learn something when I try to use my non-dominant right hand. Um, one, of the, one of the things I was thinking of then is that one's non-dominant hand is the unsung hero of the tasks because you tend to focus on what the dominant hand is doing, or I do at any rate, and you ignore what the non-dominant hand is doing. And then when you swap over and the non-dominant hand, in my case right hand, is having to learn how to do the left hand's work, but the left hand also has to learn how to use, do the right hand's work. So it is very interesting. And I was also thinking maybe people nowadays who are left-handed don't define themselves so much by their handedness. For me it was a, a big issue. Um, um, left-handed people were a bit uh, looked down on even. Uh, we couldn't write very well and we were writing with um, ink fountain pens so we would smudge our work as we, write, as we wrote from left to right as a right-hander can not smudge their work. So that's a problem that's gone away. And of course if one's using a keyboard then handedness is not at all significant. Um, and the Latin word for left is sinister, so um, it has a, has a dark side to it of course. And the, uh, I was brought up a Christian so the, uh, you sit on the right hand of God when you go to heaven if you've been good and uh, the left side of God goes down to hell. Um, so it had uh, some not good connotations, but I was always happy to be left-handed actually because it marked me out as different. One in ten people in this country approximately, I think, are, ha are left-handed. And um, it gives you the opportunity to become more ambidextrous because um, you live in a right-handed world. So I have to use my right hand for some things, whereas a right hand it doesn't, isn't forced to use the left hand in a way that, that left hand people are. What I learned then using my right hand uh, was that I was being more careful to slide the tines along the ground. I, I got the fork more flat to the ground to make sure it wasn't stuck because I obviously didn't like that catch as I lifted it. So I was trying to avoid that more than I was when I was doing it that way around. And that was sensible, so I'm going to try and do that when I do it with my left hand. It's quarter to two, I think I'm going to have to go and have some lunch. I had wanted to finish this, but it's important not to just go for completion, but to follow one's needs. Uh, and my need is for food and drink. Okay, that's all I'm going to do. Didn't take that long really, it's quarter past three. I started at midday, I had an hour for lunch, it's just over two hours. Felt like a lot of work. And I certainly haven't got up all the turf. I just stopped when I got the last full barrow. So there's quite a bit of turf still there, both loose, not so much loose, but some, and stuck in the ground. So now I'm going to plough it again having the tines going in, re in the reverse while the, while the machine is going forward which will dig in which will dig into the ground so let's see what result that has so I did three passes uh, the first one uh, long ways and uh, I had it in re reverse uh, tine turning every time so the first longitudinal pass wasn't too difficult because it was gripping well, it wasn't bouncing around like it does when you have it in forward. It was digging in nicely. But then going across was more difficult because I was going across my work and it kept bouncing in and out, it was hard to control. And then the third pass, going longitudinally again, uh, was also difficult because um, 
we'd actually got some depth to it then. It still looks a mess, but it's a very different sort of mess, a much more structured mess. Well, I was a bit optimistic. So I got my big rake out to just rake it over so I could lime it. And then, of course, I realised, which I should have realised before, there's still quite a lot of turf in there because uh, going over it three times just now has uh, pulled up the rest of the turf. So that's the bad news. The good news is it's nice and loose and I can use this bigger rake to rake it up. And uh, there's maybe five barrel loads. God help me. And um, it's nearly five o'clock and I've had enough. So I'm going to put the tools away and continue with this tomorrow. Now it does seem like a lot of hard work and I must say I'm a bit demoralised at this point having spent the whole afternoon on this and I'd hoped to uh, just have it sorted having already spent a fair bit of time on it several weeks ago uh, and sprayed it twice but it will be worth it and it repays good preparation. I'm not just getting this turf off for the sake of having compost. It won't be that good for compost anyway, but for the sake of reducing the fertility of this soil. I'm also getting it off because I want to create a nice seed bed for the wildflower seed that I will sow in, in September probably. Uh, I need to collect some from other parts of the garden. So eventually I'll have all the turf off, I'll rake it over, I'll have the, rain, the lime raked in and uh, then it will be ready. But that's for another day. Now it's early October, Friday October the 9th 2020 to be precise. And the ground has been left for some while. Uh, Alison, my gardener, uh, raked it over and got out even more of the lumps. There's still quite a few left um, and the heavy rain over the last few weeks has hardened the top layer of soil. So I'm just breaking up the top layer with a rake and then I'm going to put lime on it. Again there's two reasons for this. I've got a bag of uh, lime that's uh, not suitable for building anymore because it's too old and uh, this soil I think is a bit acid and the reason I think that is because uh, it had that weed growing on it, the um, field wood rush and apparently field wood rush likes a slightly acid soil and a way to cure it is to lime the soil. It will take the soil to a more neutral pH. It's not too breezy and the soil slightly damp so it's quite a good time to do it. Okay, I'm going to let that dry out for an hour or so in this nice drying breeze. Such a relief after such wet weather we've been having. And then I will put that bag of lime on it. So, so I've spread the bag of lime. This is uh, a little while later. It's dried out not very much, but I thought I don't want it to be too dry. Um, just dry enough to work more easily. And I spread the lime, but I forgot to film that bit. I'm just going to add a bit of wood ash from our open fire uh, just to help to sweeten up the ground if it is a bit acidic, as I suspect it is. And uh, that big pile of stuff, material, right by the compost heap, where you can see Alison, is uh, going to rot down a bit more. And then I'm going to use it as the base for my new extension to my, um, my soft fruit bed. Um, it'll provide a nice base of reasonably good 
uh, organic material on top of which I'll put lots and lots of compost. But that's for another day. Now I'm going to help Alison feed the pears again. <laughs>